This sweeping landscape that stretches to the far mountains is not a continent, it's an island. At the dawn of geological time 150 million years ago, Gondwana, a supercontinent made up of Africa, America, and Antarctica began to break apart. Madagascar separated from Africa and began to drift on the turquoise waters of the Indian Ocean. It was not until about 2,000 years ago that the first humans arrived. They were Indonesians, who had used the monsoon winds to sail their outrigger canoes all the way to the shores of Madagascar. Down through the centuries, the identity of the Malgash people took shape and would be enriched by the contributions of Arab and Indian navigators. On board Le Ponant, we'll be following in the wake of the dhows and outriggers that sailed from Muscat, Zanzibar, and Bombay to discover the sea routes that led to Madagascar. Our voyage begins in Ansiranana, the land of salt in Malgash, though the town is still called Diego Suarez by its inhabitants. With its grid work of streets lined with colonnade houses, the town could be a French provincial capital of the 1960s lost out in the tropics. The town was named after two navigators, Diego Diaz and Fernando Suarez, who discovered the bay en route to the Portuguese colonies of India. This bay is not only one of the largest in the world, along with the Bay of Rio de Janeiro, it is also one of the most sheltered. Picture this bay that has 100 kilometers of shoreline and just one narrow inlet, one kilometer wide. That's what its name, Antumbuku, means, a hole in the earth with a little entrance. So from out at sea, you can't see anything. You have to get close. You enter the channel, and that's when you catch sight of the bay. Up until the 18th century, pirates used this bay as a base from which to attack the French and English ships returning from India. When the French colonized the island at the end of the 19th century, Diego Suarez became an important port a gateway to the Indian Ocean where Comorans, Indo-Pakistanis, Yemeni, Somalis, and Chinese immigrated and mingled with the older Sakalava and Antankrana populations. That period has given Diego Suarez its present population, a cosmopolitan mosaic of different races, colors, and creeds. Diversity, but not a melting pot, for each ethnic group has remained strongly attached to its origins and traditions. So with all this in mind, just who are the true Malgash today? Even today, it's hard to really say. We've come to the conclusion that those who live in Madagascar are Malgash. But let me tell you something. I was French. I had a French national ID card. And when the country became independent, I was studying in France. I could have stayed in France, but I liked being Malgash, and I came back to Madagascar. I exchanged my French ID card for my Malgash ID card, but I still kept my name, Kassam Ali. All we Malgash are like that. We want to be Malgash because God brought us to such a wonderful land. Less than 100 kilometers from Diego Suarez is the Ankarana Special Reserve. It is a shining example of all the beauty and mystery of this land of Madagascar. This forest of limestone needles carved out by the rain five million years ago is called the Chingi. A 
a labyrinth of crevasses with their extravagant forms, this maze of ravines and sharp cliffs opening into yawning caverns was used for centuries as shelters by the Antankarana tribe, the cliff people, during their wars against Madagascar's highland tribes. In addition to the Chingi, the Ankarana Reserve is home to another of Madagascar's mysteries, the Lemur. This branch of the primate family, which is not as highly evolved as monkeys and apes, is found almost exclusively in Madagascar. When the vast island broke off from Gondwana and drifted away, there were no lemurs aboard. They most likely migrated here on islets of floating vegetation. Navigators, we could say. But just how did the lemurs manage to keep other primates from settling on their territory? For there are no monkeys or apes in Madagascar. Therein lies another mystery. It's morning, and Lepona has weighed anchor. As soon as we leave the shelter of Diego Bay, we pick up the trade winds, a powerful breeze that fills the huge sail of our three master. Perfect. We're in luck. Sun and sail. How fast are we going? 13 knots. Perfect sailing weather. Once we've rounded Cape Amber, we set our course south for Nosi Berafia in the Radama Islands. We land on a long stretch of beach swept by the riptide.
These boats, which are usually moored, are perched high and dry on the outskirts of the village. The sea is not very rough, but for Nosi Barafia's fishermen, the conditions are far from ideal. No need for traps, nets, or lines. If the water is clear and visibility good, the fishermen can simply dive to gather sea cucumbers. Its scientific name is Holothuria, and the Chinese pay a fortune for it on account of its supposed curative properties. When we go fishing for sea cucumbers, we bring back a lot. Each fisherman takes 15 to 20 like this one. That means working all day. We spend the whole day out at sea. We start diving around 8 in the morning and go till about 3 in the afternoon. And the next day it's the same routine, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And we can dive every day because sea cucumbers reproduce all the time. Once they've gathered their day's quota of sea cucumbers, the fishermen head for Grand Terre to sell their catch. The cucumbers have already disappeared from the seas of China and are in serious danger here. Even though fishing is strictly regulated, there's a lot of poaching. For the Malgash, it's just a way of making a living. We want to go back home because we're from far off. We're strangers here. That's what the song says. We want to go home to our village of Amaransana. As we leave Nosi Berafia and head south, Le Ponant runs into some heavy winds. The next morning, we're coming into Majanga, our southernmost port of call on this trip. The pirogues that are sailing back and forth across the Bay of Majanga are identical to those that for centuries carried out the trade between the city and India and Africa. This is the land of one of Madagascar's 18 ethnic groups, the Sakalava. They were formed over the centuries by intermarriage between East Africans and Yemeni, which explains why Majanga is the most Muslim city of the island. The city is a bustling hive of cars, motorcycles, and above all, rickshaws. The rickshaws were introduced at the beginning of the 20th century by the Chinese who came to work on the railway line. And now there are more than 3,000 of them weaving in and out of the traffic.
I get up very early, like all the rickshaw drivers. I go get the rickshaw at the depot. Sometimes I clean it up before I take it out to work. At noon, I take a break for lunch. And at the end of the day, when I've finished, I bring the rickshaw back to the boss's garage. That's when you have to pay the rental. It's about one euro fifty for the morning and one euro fifty for the afternoon. And that's how it goes every day. That's the life of a rickshaw driver. There's no special position you use to pull a rickshaw. There's no particular technique. But it's important that the rickshaw be in good shape. All the nuts and bolts have to be tight. The tire is well inflated. You have to check it every day before going out to work. And the passengers have to be seated in a stable position. They shouldn't rock, because then it's hard to control. Rickshaw driver is a really tiring job. It means sweat, and more sweat. Rickshaws have existed in the city for about a hundred years, but DAOs have been around for much longer. Even though motorized freighters have been in use for a long time, there are still quite a few wooden DAOs sailing the coasts of Madagascar that are exclusively wind-powered. These cargo ships from another age, invented by the Arab navigators, were masters of the Indian Ocean for more than 1,000 years. It was thanks to these vessels that the Indo-Pakistanis were able to gain commercial domination of the entire region. We do a lot of business with the Indians, the Karans. There aren't many Malagash in our line of work. It's the Indians who control the trade. So whether it's in Tuliar, Morondava, or Belo Sumer, we have to deal with them. For example, the owner of that Dao is a Karan. It's the same thing here in Majanga. It's the Karan Indians who own everything. There really aren't many Malagash in the business. While the Dows stranded on the beach like wounded birds wait for the rising tide to bring them back to life, Slender sailing pirogues continue to glide across the estuary of the Betisboka River. We follow them, and after a few kilometers find ourselves in another world, awash in the waters.
People come here to buy the staples. The boats come loaded with white rice, paddy rice, corn, pistachio nuts, fish, sometimes shrimp. They bring all that to this market here. Maravoy, the former capital of the Sakalava kingdom, was the hub of a very prosperous agricultural region. Many Indo-Pakistanis came to settle here and became wealthy traders. When the regional capital was moved to Majanga, most of the Banyans, meaning the Hindus, and the Karens, the Indo-Pakistani Muslims, left Maravoy and moved to the new capital. Which was the case with the family of Abdu Tayyab. I'm Indian. That means I speak the language. My mother tongue is Gujarati. In school, we spoke French and we read the Quran, the Holy Quran in Arabic. So I learned Arabic here in the Quranic school. We mix all the languages together. Even my four-year-old grandson speaks fluent Malgash because most of our customers are Malgash. We got rich thanks to these Malgash. My children are merchants, but my grandchildren won't carry on the family business here because their horizons have been expanded. They look to France, Europe. Their world is vaster. We have education now, information technology, all that. The small-scale family retail business is a thing of the past. The day is drawing to a close. The last rays of sunlight set this giant baobab aglow. This tree, several hundred years old, is the living witness of Majanga's history and its present vitality. Le Ponant has once again taken to the sea. Like every evening since we left Diego Suarez, the captain holds his traditional meeting with the passengers in the lounge to give them a rundown on the weather and our next day's stopover. we changed direction. With the ship under full sail, we set our course north for Nosi Iranja, a small island paradise near Nosi Bay. A turquoise blue sea, intense green vegetation, Nosi Iranja lulls beneath the warm sunbeams lapped by the waves of the Indian Ocean.
nothing seems to disturb this perfect harmony. Not even the fishing party that's underway at the far end of the beach. Just a few meters from the shore, the young fishermen cast their net. Then they form a circle and advance making noise and splashing to scare the fish into the trap that they close little by little. And so, thanks to what seems an effortless game, the village youngsters have put lunch on the table. The youngsters, with their open, generous nature, seem to enjoy living together. The picture seems too good to be true, yet Gilbert, the son of the village chief, confirms our impressions. Here in the village, you have the wise folks, the elders. They organize the social life of the village. But you also have the young people, the girls and boys. There's no conflict because the elders give advice to the youngsters. So everybody in the village gets along fine. In this village, where everybody seems content just living together, there's even an artiste. Janvier, meaning January, for that's the month he was born in, is a musician and passes his time singing in the village lanes. You see this instrument here? I made it myself. I strung it myself and made the sound box. As for the tunes, I play Saligi, Antozi, sometimes Dombolo songs. I play a bit of everything. I would really like to be able to earn my living with my music, to become a real pro someday. The old folks don't have Janvier's dreams of glory. They carry on living as in the past, taking what nature offers, whether it be fish or coffee. But the young dream of a different life. Le Ponant lying at anchor is a reminder to them that Nossi Bay is not far away. Nossi Bay with its shops and tourist hotels. It's normal to live in the village where you grew up, where you're used to living. If I had to live somewhere else, in Nossi Bay, for example, it wouldn't be easy for me. I'm not familiar with that place. Now, if you had a good reason to live somewhere else, why not leave? But you never know what your life will be like somewhere else. So I think it's better to stay put. I'd be willing to leave, but only if I were rich. 
I didn't choose to live in that house roofed with corn husks, but it's mine because I'm poor, and that's why I stay here. But if I get rich someday, maybe I'd leave. I might even go to another country. But in the meantime, since I have no money, I'll stay right here in my village. Ponant takes to the sea for the last time on this voyage. Next stop, Nosy Bay. We drop anchor at Nosy Bay. In spite of the wind, there are still some ragged clouds clinging to the distant peaks. The Zodiac boats are lowered and we head for Elville, the capital of Nosy Bay. Over the past few decades, Nosy Bay has become one of the most popular tourist sites of the Indian Ocean. Nevertheless, Elville has managed to keep its authentic Malgache character, even though the French influence here dates back to the mid-19th century, about 50 years earlier than the rest of Madagascar. Threatened by the Marina tribes from the highlands, the Sakalava sovereigns requested military support from the French. Thus, in 1841, the Sakalava queen Tsiomeko granted the island of Nosy Bay to Admiral de L, who was governor of Ile Bourbon, now Reunion Island, in exchange for his protection. The courthouse, the prison, the government house, most of the colonial buildings that give the town its quaint charm date from that period. When the French arrived here in Nosy Bay, there were already prosperous Indian and Arab merchants doing good business in this bay, which is one of the best sheltered on the island. They had set up a trading post called Ambanoro Marodoka, which means literally, the place of many shops. Not far from the ruins of the old trading post lives a community of Sakalaba. Maoli Day is 89 years old. He spent his life sailing the Indian Ocean. Now he's come back to live out his old age here in Ambanoro. I started sailing on Indian boats. Twice to Mombasa. Twice to the Seychelles. And I did the whole coast of Africa. As deckhand, cook, my grandfather and grandmother were pure African. Arab slave traders sold them here to the Indians. My grandfather and grandmother were born in Africa. They were abducted by the Arabs to be sold here. Like every day, while the men are out fishing, the village women get together to chat and do their makeup, a ritual that probably goes back to their African ancestors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
The Sakalava and the Africans lived up in the hills, way up there. And down here, you had the Arabs and the Indians. These huge warehouses, now overrun by the vegetation, give an idea of the vitality of the trade that the Indo-Pakistanis had developed here in Ambanoro. There was no one here before the Arabs. The Arabs were the first group of people to settle here in Ambanoro. Then, around 1839, the Indo-Pakistanis started arriving. But they came here because they knew it was already a trading town, a center of commerce. So right away, they got on good terms with the Arabs in order to do business here. The main business was the slave trade. There were big ships that came from Bombay, from Zanzibar, and sometimes from Oman. The Arabs would bring the African slaves here, and the traders would come from Bombay with merchandise, and they would trade. The abolition of slavery in the French colonies in 1848 would give the French, the new rulers of the island, the opportunity to put an end to the commercial dominance of Ambanoro. The Arabs leave Nosy Bay, and the Indians transfer their activity to Elville, where even today their business is still thriving. The history of Nosy Bay, like that of northwest Madagascar in general, has been continually enriched by the arrival of new immigrants. The Sakalava, the Arabs, the Indians, the French. But Russians? Why are there Russian graves in Hellville Cemetery? The key to this mystery is to be found in a bay a few hours away from Nosy Bay, the aptly named Russian Bay. Morning, we board a dhow and set our course for Russian Bay. This boat belongs to Nicolas, a Frenchman who's been living in the region for about 20 years. He has a passion for antique boats and the stories and legends that go with them. When he saw the pirogues and dhows of Madagascar, it was love at first sight. So he dropped anchor here, had his own dhow built, and now spends his time and energy to showing off this magnificent coast to travelers. And at the same time, he tries to recreate the magic of the voyages of days gone by. These are cargo boats that go all the way back to the Arab conquests, the Arab trade routes in the northern Indian Ocean. 
So for me, they are steeped in history. They have incredible sails. They just whisk us centuries back in time. And even now it works, it sails. When you're lucky enough to see a sight like that at dawn, those vast sails, the conch shell they blow, the whole atmosphere of loading that's busy and serene at the same time, because these are sailing ships and they have the sort of serenity of a huge caravan getting underway. I said to myself, to sail like that just has to stir your imagination. The 90 kilometers of coast between Nosy Bay and the Radama Islands are off the path of the trade winds, so they still have these light thermal winds in the morning and during the day, like what we're getting right now. We get these thermals 300 days a year. We get this weather 300, 320 days a year. We don't even worry about the weather we'll be getting. And ever since the dawn of time, there have been sailors who, all of a sudden, after months of hard sailing on the high seas, they see that. It was amazing. The coast treats us to a series of breathtaking spots, one after the other, in different styles, and they all made good hideouts. It was quite something for the slave traders, the smugglers, everybody. But just what were the Russians doing here in this bay that now bears their name? The story begins in February 1904. War breaks out between Russia and Japan. The Russian fleet in the Baltic sets sail to hook up with the Pacific fleet. Part of the fleet takes the Suez Canal route, and the other part, with the bigger boats, rounds the Cape of Good Hope. They rendezvous at Madagascar. After a few months, the fleet is once again reunited. But Russia has already lost the war. What remains of the 20,000 Russian sailors stay here? A few wrecks at the bottom of the sea? Some blue-eyed Malagash? On the shore, there's not the slightest trace. There's only the elusive memory of an incredible maritime adventure. Our Madagascar adventure is drawing to a close. Now it's time to take a look at the interior of the island as we did when we landed at Diego Suarez. On the hillsides here, they grow ilang ilang, a plant that comes from Malaysia and which is now a gold mine for Nosy Bay. The ilang ilang plants are pruned regularly to keep them low so that picking is easier. Can you want that a hand Oh. <laughs>
Once a day, they bring the flowers to the distillery. The essence that they extract with these old copper charcoal heated stills will be used in the world's most famous perfumes. Even though Madagascar is opening up to the world, the traditions brought over from Africa are still alive in the villages. The chumba, or ancestor cult, is one of the most common. During the trances that may last several hours, the living enter into contact with the dead. This cult has existed for a very long time. It's the ancestor cult, worship of the ancients. When the elders die, their spirit inhabits us. The elders live within us. They enter into all the living people. In a way, it's the old ones that direct the living. It's they who guide us. The last paddle strokes, the last crossing. We're headed for the Loco Bay Reserve. Here in the heart of this primeval forest is where the lemurs live. They are true natives of Madagascar. 
they witnessed the arrival of the first navigators from Indonesia and all those who followed to forge the Malgash people. <laughs> 